Okay, I think I just started the cloud recording. Let me start my backup recording. And I probably should explain what this is backup of, at least to this first time. It's a backup of my face, face or um, recording of my face. So I think some of you might have seen the YouTube record um, recording that was posted to YouTube. The link was shared with you in one of the announcements. And um, when I do those edits, uh, I found it useful to have a recording of my face all the time, whether I use it all the time or not. And uh, the first time we were doing this, uh, you know, before COVID, I think we were using Zoom back in 2018. Uh, when we are doing it, I tried with the different Zoom settings and I could never get it to consistently record my face. So this is my backup. It's a software running on my computer that's recording uh, <laughs> what you're seeing here along with it, and it's also a backup of my audio this is a slightly higher quality audio than what gets recorded through zoom just because it's not going through internet so you will see me starting this at the beginning of every session virtual class session you will see and um and the purpose of the recording is it's a backup recording let me put my um what's going to become my usual welcome message in the chat and then I'll just uh, start from top. So, welcome. Thank you so much for joining in this uh, virtual class session. If you have any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask or put your question into the chat window. Okay, let me mute the chime thing that chimes. I know none of you hear it, but I hear it. And um, actually it gets, uh, uh, kind of becomes part of the recording because of the way this uh, backup recording records the sound. So Zoom knows to ignore the sound it makes, but this one doesn't. So anyways, <laughs> so welcome. Uh, thank you for joining in this. I said a virtual class session. I meant to say online orientation session in real time. If you have a, so um, I do mean uh, where I say, if you have any questions, please feel free to admit yourself and ask. Um, and uh, the main reason I'm saying that is, so you are going to hear me basically talk nonstop. And as you will learn very soon, when we are in the lab together and we are interacting, I know how to shut up. Um, it's one of the first things they teach you when you are learning to teach, how to use awkward silences in a way that's uh, productive pedagogically. <laughs> but, um, you know, a lot of the psychology that's involved in that, I think that really works uh, better in person, where if no one's speaking, like people do feel uncomfortable, and I can outlast that uncomfortableness over, you know, your younger people folks. Uh, but online, it just doesn't work this way. I think you can see kind of a part of that, which uh, don't take this any kind of pressure, but I'm the only one on video. So I think if I suddenly like I didn't say anything, I don't think any of you would feel uncomfortable with that silence. So this online session, uh, I decided to go with a different convention, which is convention more common in the broadcasting world, which is that we minimize dead air. Uh, radio stations act actually get fined if they have too long of a dead air. So that's why you're going to hear me speak nonstop. And what I really want to remind you, especially for first a couple of these online sessions, is that the fact that I'm speaking nonstop is not a disinvitation to questions. So uh, if you feel comfortable doing it, and I said if I said something that uh, doesn't make sense and looks like I'm going to move on, just unmute yourself and ask. Don't feel like you're interrupting because I'm frankly leaving you no other choice. I'm not going to be silent long enough to people to just be able to say stuff without feeling like you're interrupting. So just interrupt away. Now, if uh, you feel uncomfortable doing that, that's what the second part is for. Or put your question into the chat window. Um, chat is never distracting. Uh, for those of you who are here in real time, I shared my second screen, how um, I keep track of the chat and other windows in my second screen that's over here. So uh, when you send it, put it into chat, I can look at it and address it when I, the timing feels right. And about the chat messages, so you will see um, chat messages that are sent to everyone get recorded. Uh, now, if you sent it before the start of the Zoom session, then you, um, you know, it wasn't recorded. And looks like this time, uh, let me just do this. Um, let's see, A, B, C, D. I'm going to just try to make my Zoom window small enough so that I can drag it over here and share it without um, the previous messages being shown. So, <laughs> 
Um, so if you send it to everyone, then it'll get captured in recording. So these messages that I put in here, you will see that uh, as part of the Zoom recording link that I'll share. But um, if you so if you are comfortable asking questions that way, then please do. Uh, I'll look at it, address it when I feel I can address it properly. Now, if somehow you feel uncomfortable with any part of your identity being in the recording, um, then you can change this to uh, me. You can if you click on it. You can change it to my name, and if you send them, that'll be a private message, and private messages won't be recorded in the Zoom recording. So, and as I was saying before starting the recording, I'm usually really careful about not dragging this into the shared screen. So, um, so whatever is in my private message, it won't be part of the recording. I'll be careful about uh, keeping this chat window um, on my second screen so that it's not shared. So, so that's a longish explanation of my setup and some of the operating conventions that you will see. And um, uh, let's just start with the, the agenda. And I guess uh, um, as you are starting with the agenda, uh, so some of the things that you will see, for those of you who are in my physics 4A, it's the exact same setup. I, uh, one, I'm uh, consistent to a fault. So, um, so things, stuff I was doing for 4A, you can probably expect me to do that for 4B. Um, in fact, you know, this is, this is probably more or less the same agenda. I tweaked a couple things. Uh, I'll point those out. Um, so introduction, saying hi, a few begin the semester note. So uh, for people who are here in real time, we did a, a little intro going around before we started the recording. Let me just say my piece again, um, just for the sake of recording, and then I'll go get to the rest. So hi, my name is Andrew Park. I'm your instructor for Physics 4B. Um, I've uh, taught Physics 4A before this class last semester. So welcome back to people who are in my Physics 4A and also welcome to people who are new. I was saying how much I appreciate people being here because um, I love teaching this class and um, unless I have people who are new to COA for Physics 4B, like they would have canceled this class. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you for being here. Um, so a few beginning of semester notes. So, you know, I posted this announcement uh, past the Sunday. I meant to post it earlier, but I lost the track of time. Uh, and uh, depending on when you were accessing the Canvas uh, site for the first time, you might not have seen it. Because when you look at it, this widget is set up to display the one single most uh, recent announcement. So it says, welcome to week one. If you thought that was the only announcement, that's why I have this link here, because there's one announcement prior to that. So um, so I posted this in every one of my classes, every single semester, because it is really important. Um, the, the really important thing here is making sure the lines of communication are open. So with the online class, what you will find if you haven't already learned it from previous online classes is that it puts a lot of burden on you. Uh, you have to make sure that you keep up because we don't have a regular in-person lecture that you can come in and be reminded of stuff. We do have an in-person lab, but that's only once a week, only three hours per week when regular in-person classes would be meeting seven hours a week, four hours of lecture, three hours of lab. Um, so given that much burden is on you to keep up, um, sort of the most I can do is I, I can send you reminders. And when I'm sending you reminders, especially uh, for people who have fallen behind, it's going to be through Peralta email. And uh, actually, that's uh, what I'll use if the other method didn't work. My first method is going to be Canvas message. And then when and if that doesn't work and I haven't seen you in lab a couple times, then I'll be sending you an email. And for this to work, uh, you have to have the ability to check your email regularly. And um, uh, what I would recommend is if, uh, you know, I think for vast majority of people, you are probably not using your Peralta email as mail email. If you are, great. If you are not, like me, I don't use Peralta email as my main email, then please afford it. Um, there's a whole set of instructions. Um, I think uh, if you go to this link here for your Peralta email, that'll um, walk you through the set of steps. Some of these have changed. You know, I don't know if this link still works. Yeah, I think it does. Okay. Yeah. So uh, some of the, like the, the uh, user interface might look a little different. 
but these steps still work. Um, look up forwarding and put in your email for the forwarding and um, that's what I would recommend. Um, you can also change your preferred email in Campus Solutions. Um, you can do that too. Um, but I guess uh, the main message is whatever email address I have for you, whether it's Peralta email or something else, make sure that it's something you check regularly, like a minimum once a day. So after that's done, there's a whole um, a bunch of stuff that I would like to ask you to check. This is really a matter of um, organizing uh, communications that are course related. And this is how I will be organizing it. So I'm asking you to uh, kind of follow along so that um, the way I use uh, Canvas's way of communicating, they reach you in a way that I intended for them to reach you. So um, that's the second item. Make sure you are receiving course notifications. So if you go to notification setting, you can click this link or you can click on your profile picture and then notifications, either works fine. Um, you'll see the notification setting. You can set it at account level or the course level. I just keep it at account level. I don't want to complicate it. And in fact, what I would recommend for most of these items is set it as notify immediately. Uh, anything that notifies you too much and bothers you, you're going to figure it out. And when you figure it out, then turn it down. Like uh, I used to have all submissions as notify immediately. Then I realized that every time someone turns something in, I'm going to get notifications. So uh, that's too much. I turned it down to daily summary. But I still have late submissions turned on so that when someone's getting caught up with a course, I can kind of be notified as they are doing that. Um, and uh, so, you know, when you set everything to notify immediately, some of the stuff you will never get notified about, like this group membership stuff. I think I've gotten notified about this basically one time when we were doing professional development and they put us uh, instructors into a group. Like, that was the only time I never <laughs> had to be bothered with that. And it's still set as notify immediately. So um, uh, now I, I do get that um, you are probably taking, well, you're definitely taking courses more than this one, and you may be taking courses at multiple districts. And you are, so I'm managing just to this class and my one other class, Physics 4A this semester. I, I get that you probably have more classes than I do. So, um, so if you don't want to set everything as notify immediately as I was maybe asking you to, then what I would ask you to strongly consider setting as notify immediately are these three things plus one more thing that I'm going to mention. The three things are one, announcement. So if you don't have announcement as a set as notify immediately, even daily summary, then you probably didn't get an announcement about uh, this session, the one that says welcome to week one, because I posted that this morning and um, and uh, they, Canvas usually sends out daily somewhere like after 6 p.m. You might be just getting it now <laughs> as we are speaking. <laughs> so um, I do try not to announce anything where you need to act within uh, 24 hour notice. So I try to avoid doing that, but it's uh, the matter of, you know, why put on unnecessary delay? If you have it notified immediately, then when I post announcements, you know, in the old days, I would have sent it out as class email. And as long as you have set this as notify immediately, you get class announcements like an email. So um, that's what I'm to ask. Um, the second thing is the Canvas conversation message. Because uh, as a way of um, um, making things easier for me and organizing course-related communication, whenever I'm reaching out to you about course-related stuff, I'm going to use the Canvas conversation message. Because I use email for other things. Uh, if I try to use email for the course stuff, they get buried. It's, I want to try to separate them out if I can, so that later if I need to find a particular message, it's easier. So when I send the Canvas conversation message, I would like it to receive it like on an email. And that only works if you have the notification as notify immediately. So that's the second thing. Third thing, this took me a while to figure out, maybe a semester to its a submission comment. So, um, so this is where most of my grading feedback goes. When I'm grading your conceptual questions or peer reviews, maybe I might have something to tell you, something that you might need to change for the future to avoid losing points. 
and it'll go into the submission comment for that assignment item. Again, it's a way of organizing communication so that later on when I'm reviewing your work and I'm um, trying to figure out what did I say to you on what, it's a lot easier if I can find it attached to that assignment. And um, unless you have submission comment notification turned on, ideally notify immediately, but at a minimum like daily or weekly summary, unless you have it turned on, you might not be getting my feedback ever. Or you might be only seeing my feedback when uh, you go to the assignment item and you notice something in the sidebar saying, oh yeah, there's a something there. And that's not the ideal situation. Ideal situation is it, this is set up as notify immediately so that um, whenever I leave feedback, you get it like as if I sent it to you by email and, and um, it, it's something that you can reflect in your future submissions. So, um, so those are the three things that I would ask you to send us notify immediately. Also mentioned all here, announcement, conversation message, submission comment. And I would like to ask you to um, turn one more thing as notify immediately. And it has to do with where these um, online session recordings go. Where the online session recordings go, right now I can't demonstrate it, but it will be under discussions. Um, I'll be posting it under discussions and pin it up here so that you can find it here. Now, you could always come to discussions and find it here, but another way you can be notified immediately when a recording is posted is if under discussions, you turn new topic on. And I get that, especially if you're taking other online classes, some instructors might have more robust the participation rules where um, they have weekly discussion and you have to post uh, once and reply to your classmate and list once. And I get that some of these notifications get, get super annoying. Like if there's a new reply and you get notified, I have it as notified immediately, but I totally understand if you, you don't want to have it be. So what I would ask you to do is just set new topic as notify immediately. This will notify you when someone posts a new topic under discussions. So when I um, post a new recording, it'll be a new topic. It'll be something I post this way and that you'll get notification of that. And here's the second other reason I would like you to set that notification. So this course discussion is set up in a way where if as a student, you wanna post a new thread, you can. It's been enabled for you to be able to do that. And uh, I would like you to be able to reach your classmates this way if that's something you choose. And um, the only way this would work is if a decent number of people get notification. So that's my other reason why I would like you to set the notification setting so that if a, a classmate of yours posts a new thread, like something entirely separate from anything that's required for the course, then you, you'll get notified and you will act or not act, but at least you'll be notified. It won't be something that just leaves there seen by no one. So those are items relating to communication. I know this took a while. <laughs> Always takes a while. So, um, so we've done that. Um, and uh, anything that I missed, please look at the announcement. Um, and uh, so I want to spend the most of the, well, at least the majority of the time here doing the course demo as test student. Let me just uh, take care of a couple items. So, um, uh, oh, reminder of Tuesday's in-person lab session. So I think I've said this in a bunch of places. Tomorrow's in-person lab session, uh, we are here. This is our street address, please. Um, know where we are. It's not at the main campus. We are a couple of blocks away from the main campus. And and I think I'll, I also have similar message in the syllabus. Basically, anything that I want to um, be able to tell people, hey, it was in the syllabus. It's in the syllabus. <laughs> so lab sessions, we are meeting Tuesdays here, 6 to 9 p.m. And this is our street address. Um, and uh, yeah, in the syllabus, I do say, you know, if you don't want to... Um, read through the rest of this, it's fine. I'll remind you when something becomes important. Oh, I meant to update this and I forgot. I'll update this after the session. We are late releasing our catalog and I only noticed that we had a new catalog this week, uh, past week. And so I'll, I'll go back and fix that. Um, so 
Yeah, so we have live session tomorrow. Please come. Uh, my main goal is to just to check who's local, like make sure that you can actually attend the in-person lab because if you can't, then you really shouldn't be in this class because I, I do enforce an attendance at lab session. That's one thing that I'm relatively strict about. Um, if you so, if you can come tomorrow, please do. Somehow, if you can't, uh, send me a message or email. We really should uh, uh, make sure that you can. Um, you have ability to stay in class. <laughs> um, so that's the uh, reminder of the lab session tomorrow. And the other thing relates to actually this. I'm trying something different this semester that people who are in my physics foray might know this. So instead of um, waiting to send my office hours and what I'm going to be calling virtual class session, like this session, uh, until I have feedback from you, what I thought I might do is I want to just, uh, um, I, I just set a time uh, that those are the times you see in syllabus. And, but I still want your feedback. If uh, it might be worthwhile to change any of the times, then I want you to tell me. So that's what this survey is for. Uh, I've repurposed my old survey. And what the survey will show you, uh, tell you, is that we have a virtual class session scheduled on Fridays, 2 to 3 p.m. So I, I will hold a session this Friday, because uh, there's probably some material to cover. And uh, my office hour, I'm trying to say something regular. So I just put it Monday through Thursday, 11 to 12, 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. Um, so I'll be here every day, 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. And, um, and, it's, and the rest of the quest survey question is basically, you know, if I should uh, schedule either an additional time or change any of these times. Um, and uh, I'll, um, based on the responses I see, I will um, decide on what to do. And finally, this is just the free form uh, response that I'm looking for. Uh, sometimes people will tell me about their full-time work. And usually if it's one or two people, we can work with the uh, individual arrangement. But if it's something else, then something else. So I'm going to pu uh, publish this survey right now. So for people who know what to do, you can probably access this right now and answer it right now. Um, but uh, I won't ask you to do that. I will post the link to this uh, in the announcement that I'll post about the recording for this session being available. So you can uh, use the link then, although like if you're in this session right now, you see this link, <laughs> nothing prevents you from going to the end. Actually, the link is available in one other place, but it's the one other place that I don't want people to use. So uh, I'll highlight where it is and I, why I'm telling you not to use it. <laughs> so that's the, uh, the rest of the agenda items. If there are any questions, if I said anything that's confusing, now is the time to stop me and make sure I address it. Um, if not, <laughs> I warned you that I won't wait too long. Then uh, I'll start the course demo. Um, I'm going to go in as test student. I've deliberately not done any work as test student. And I'll work through the course um, to address some of the questions that I've gotten in the past. And, uh, you know, if a questions come up that you forgot to ask in that brief one, two second delay, you can always put it into chat or again, unmute yourself and ask. I'm going to be basically talking nonstop. So I uh, want you to feel comfortable just, uh, you know, interrupting, if, if, even if uh, that feels uncomfortable because uh, there's no <laughs> other way this session can work because I can't give you a lot of uh, pauses where no one's going to say anything. So with that, uh, let me go into test the student view and um, show you the screen that you will be seeing when you access the course for the first time from the dashboard. So where you should be is in the home screen, assuming you are using web browser. If you are using Canvas mobile app, um, uh, there's a reason I uh, recommend that you don't use it. Uh, you will see it in one of the later pages. So in this home page, I hope you know you look at the, this beautiful home page and look at read all this stuff. I put in a lot of thought into these short two, maybe three paragraphs, and um, I want you to follow the instructions here. You know, click on start here and go from there. And um, um, and one thing that I definitely don't want you to use, maybe not even look at it, is this thing on the sidebar. There's this to-do sidebar that I think a lot of people might have gotten into habit of doing. 
And uh, you know, if you're using this to track uh, announcements I've made, then that's great. I have no objection to that. Uh, in fact, you know, this is maybe the only way you can see this announcement on the home page. Otherwise, you have to go through the announcement page and all that. So, if you are using that to read the announcement and track it, great, no objection. You know, uh, make disappear the announcement you have seen. The everything else, I don't want you to even. I want you to pretend that this doesn't exist. Because this causes a really more confusion than any other Canvas feature I see in my class. If I could have disabled this, I would, but I can't. So I, you know, <laughs> what I'm telling you now is the most I can do. So imagine someone who's looking at this page. They are looking at the sidebar. Oh, it says to do. So it must be something for me to do. So you click on this. And then you see this screen that's super confusing. It's especially confusing if you are seeing this uh, tomorrow night, like uh, this is going to be due and it's locked. What am I going to do? And, <laughs> and the thing is, if you slow down and read all this message, then you can see what you should have done. So it says that this uh, hasn't been unlocked yet. And I will contend that that's an incomplete sentence. It should always say it hasn't been unlocked yet by you. There's nothing I can do to unlock it for you. I know I get this message, I think almost every semester. Professor, this page is locked and it's due in an hour. Uh, could you please unlock it? Um, if I see that message in time, I'll tell them I can unlock it. You have to unlock it. I'll point them out to you know these messages. So if you do read the error message, then you can see what you have to do to unlock this. You gotta view this page and then view this page and then view this page and so on. Um, and so, so you know, it, it, I, I guess it's not a fate that you should be confused by the fact that this is locked. But still, you know, it, it, this, uh, um, it all comes down to those links in the to-do sidebar that you think is something for you to use. No, they are not. They, their access has been locked through use of Canvas module prerequisites. So the way you should access the course content is through the module view. That's how the course is intended to be viewed, and that's how you should access it. And that's why, even though you can access the the survey right now through this link, um, because you know that's an item that's not in the module prerequisites chain, so you can access this right now if you want to. But I'm telling you not to do that because I don't want to send a mixed message. I, I want to just be a, have a consistent message. Ignore the to do bar because it's not gonna do you any good. And, and the biggest reason for that is, so this is the to-do bar that you see as a test, uh, you see as a student, that I see as a test student. When I'm in my, I'm usually not in the test student view, I'm usually in instructor view. And instructor view, my to-do says the stuff I should do as an instructor. So oftentimes, uh, I, I have no idea what's on your to-do bar. So a lot of, so that's why if there's stuff in to -do, your to-do bar that's confusing you, I won't have known about it until you told me about it. And I, over the years, I figured the best thing to do is just tell people, ignore it, don't use it. It's uh, me as instructor, never see it. So I, um, so like this is not even on my mind at all, except when I'm telling you not to use it. So, um, so the way you should view the course, you know, usually I go through the start here for my physics 4A, but let me skip the modules. I'm telling you that modules view is the way it's meant to be viewed. You can click on that button on the home page just like I just did, or you can use the sidebar link, either works fine. So in modules view is the view where you will see everything. You can even see everything that's locked. You can scroll all the way through the end of the semester and see everything that's been laid out here. So, um, so that modules view is what I would recommend. You see the course as so that uh, you can see everything here. And within this modules view, it will also tell you what the prerequisites are. It will tell you for this page you have to view it, and for a bunch of items you just have to view it. Which means I can do this. I can go into this page, which is the link a star here would have taken me. And uh, because I've read all this before, I can skip it and I can just keep clicking Nest and, and you know, go on that way. Now, uh, I do joke that test student is my worst student. Uh, I don't recommend that you do what I'm doing as test student. He's lazy. He doesn't do stuff that he feels he doesn't have to. That's not what I would recommend 
uh, people do. But um, as far as what I'm willing to require that you do, for a lot of these pages, it's information that I think uh, you should have. Um, but at the same time, how much does it matter to me that you actually read it? Um, you know, I think uh, I the fact that I made the information available to you is enough for me to defend myself on whether um, you should have known it. So, um, so I'm telling you, you know, um, read it. But I haven't done any. I haven't taken any steps to require you to actually read it, um, except here. <laughs> I'm here at the graded discussion, and it's still locked. What am I? What do I have to do? And uh, if you again read the error message, it'll tell you what you have to do. It says, "Oh, I have to do this." Um, so this, uh, for whatever reason, wasn't set as a view requirement. It was set with a kind of requirement that takes an action on your part. So that honor code pledge, I shouldn't have just clicked next. I should have actually done something on that page. So, uh, so on this page, uh, let me um, do this honor code pledge. This is really the first item where I felt too strongly that you should really read it, and I should have proof that you read it. And when I was thinking through it, I know some instructors use syllabus quiz and all that stuff. Um, uh, I didn't think a syllabus quiz would make people read it. I mean, you might have syllabus side by side just to, you know, go through the quiz. And um, it's uh, sort of uh, uh, the thing that I really care about the most is the academic integrity um, on our code. And um, I think I thought if it's any kind of quiz, it would be easier for people who are willing to be dishonest <laughs> to go through the quiz. So, um, so I wanted to skip all those intermediate steps, make it simple, just make you type it. Uh, make you type this block of text so that I know in some way this block of text made it through your head somehow. <laughs> so, you know, uh, sometimes people will just say type their name. Then what that tells me is that, oh, you didn't read the instructions. And that's a part of the purpose of this assignment to tell people, you know, please read the instructions. Don't just type your name read the instructions and actually follow it. And sometimes people will do this and thinking, you know, how is uh, Andrew going to know if I did this or not? Like, I mean, I'm asking you to type this entire block of text. If you did this, like, how am I going to know? Uh, so I'm not going to put this on recording, but let me show you in the lab session on Tuesday how I do know uh, if someone copied and pasted. it. And my instruction to you is please type it. And uh, anybody who's not doing this properly, I can basically uh, zero out the score and make you come back to this until you do it correct. Okay. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm, um, I'm not a big requirements guy. I don't like making people do stuff. Um, but when I do say something is a requirement, you can bet that I have thought of how to enforce it. So, uh, so let me do this. Uh, 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 honor code pledge as, as test student, my worst student, and just type this out. I test the student will make submissions that represent my own work, not share my own work, and solutions with anyone else except where explicitly a lot, not engage in. And you see me um, correcting typos. Uh, that's more because of my OCD than anything else. It's an all manually reviewed. So if it's, uh, there are typos in there or not, I don't care. The main thing is that the bulk of the text you typed it. Uh, the time assessment and not engage in any other activities that this honestly my results or dishonest. And you can see my error rate goes up when I'm doing other stuff while I'm typing. Although, so as I, I, I'm speaking other things while I do this as a kind of a demonstration that, you know, me requiring you to type this isn't a guarantee that you are paying your attention when you're typing it. I can multitask. I can type one thing and say other things. And because I can do it, I assume other people can too. Um, it's, but, it's a, but this is the most I could do to make sure that some portion of the this text somehow made it through your brain, even if you are multitasking and paying attention to other stuff while you're doing it. And, and I'm a pretty good typist. It's possible that a good number of you can't multitask while you're typing, which is better. <laughs> so uh, let me do that. And this is the mechanism that will allow me to proceed while um, I'm going to 
allow me test to start the proceed while I, the instructor, will grade this manually. So let me submit it. And the amount of time people spend on this, it varies wildly. You know, although I'll say four minutes is kind of an average. Uh, I know I spent wasted a lot of time. Um, if I really focus and type, I can do this in like one and a half minutes. And I think I've seen people do that. There are some students who can type, you know, 100 words per minute, 120 words per minute. Um, and then there are people who will take like 10 minutes because they're doing it on a phone and whatnot. Uh, so the method I use to test if people are copying and pasting or not, I'll, again, I'll show that to you in Tuesday's lab. And it doesn't rely on the amount of time you spent. Although uh, I've seen people who literally spend like five seconds on it, like as if they weren't even thinking. <laughs> but I'll, more on that on the in the lab tomorrow. I think uh, I've put everything on the recording that I'm willing to put on recording. So now this is finally unlocked. Now I can finally participate. Um, and when you look in the modules, you will see that this has, a, again, different requirement. It doesn't have a view requirement. As you can see from modules, and it finishes loading, um, it has contribute requirement, which means for this to be checked, I have to contribute. And um, this is one of the requirements that's hardest for me to clear as an instructor. Like a scores, I can just assign a score. Um, submission, if I excuse the assignment, it Canvas considers that submitted. But this contribute requirement, I haven't been able to clear it manually. Or at least it has never been consistent. So um, to clarify for a test student, I actually have to make a reply. So I thought I would do just to uh, um, accomplish two goals at the same time and do my proper longer intro. So I'll be answering this as Andrew Park, your instructor, um, not as test student. But in future graded, graded discussions, you might see test student basically saying, clearing module requirements. And the reason you say that is because I have no other way to clear module requirements for the test student. So. Uh, let me do my intro. So I'll say, hi, my name is uh, Andrew Park, uh, and I prefer, actually not end, too many ends. I prefer to go by Andrew, uh, and I'm your instructor um, for this class. Why? It's, it, that doesn't look right. Uh, and, and I'm... Oops, sorry. Te teaching this class, not taking it. I think that's the phrasing I usually use. And teaching this class, not taking it. Um, uh, yeah, uh, let me actually expand. Fred to go by Andrew. Um, although, if you feel com uncomfortable, Portable with, uh, you can say Mr. Park. Uh, Dr. Park is wrong. If you call me Dr. Park, what I will know is that you never watched this orientation session. I never finished my PhD. I was in a PhD program at UC Berkeley, but <laughs> at some point I had enough of it. Um, it's okay, so we can say Mr. Park. And I'm teaching this class, not taking it. Um, so let me... Let me share my favorite reason for teaching, uh, not reason for, uh, favorite thing about teaching this class um, as to why am I teaching it? Well, it's a job. I mean, it is a job I do get paid. <laughs> Maybe not. Uh, favorite thing about teaching this class, uh, uh, which is that it is a class uh, primarily on electromagnetism. Is the first class that gives a proper coverage to the first uh, complete uh, the fundamental theory of physics. Electro, uh, electro magnetism or electrodynamics as uh, upper division classes often refer to it. 
Um, I, I've seen textbooks that call Newton's law of universal gravitation the first uh, theory of physics, but it's got only one equation in it. Um, electromagnetism, you will see Maxwell's equations. It's got four equations in it, all interlocked, and um, and um, yeah. So and that's uh, actually going to be the main reason for which I uh, switch to some of the order in which we cover topics. I'll mention that before we end end the session today. Um, so it's the first class that gives proper coverage to the first complete fundamental theory of physics, magnetism. Um, so I, I like teaching it. It's, it's the crown jewel of classical physics. It's a really uh, important piece of, um, uh, like for those of you who might go on to be physics majors, a lot of the efforts, even the physicists are engaged in today, you know, unify the theory of everything, all that stuff. It um, kind of starting journey for that is really unification of electricity and magnetism. So, um, yes, okay, that's uh, uh, why you're taking class or why I'm teaching the class. And one or more follow questions to answer. So, um, um, the, I was uh, physics and pure mathematics double major at UC Berkeley. By the way, this is, uh, I consider this a mistake. I should have done applied math. Or maybe chemistry. <laughs> pure mathematics was so inefficient, overlapping classes wise. A double major at UC Berkeley, and I was in the PhD program at um, UC Berkeley, <laughs> um, although. Uh, uh, in physics, uh, although I didn't finish it, I graduated uh, with a master's, uh, which qualifies me to teach here. Um, physics, uh, uh, doing um, research on atomic, molecular, and optical physics. There are different areas of physics, uh, uh, modern physics research. This is one of, you know, it's probably the, one of the oldest because it touches us directly on quantum mechanics and it's kind of older <laughs> than particle physics, solid state physics. Um, let's see. And what college do you consider to be? Home? So I'm just going to answer all the questions. You don't have to, you can just choose one. Um, uh, um, and I'm uh, teaching physics here at College of Alameda full-time. I'm not teaching anywhere else. This is my full-time job. Uh, so that's uh, one of the things um, that I'll mention when I invite people to, um, if you can make the office hours, uh, appoint, uh, I have other hours available by appointment. A lot of different times I should be able to make. I don't have any other, other than physics for a, I don't have any other commitments. And finally, how do you learn best? Uh, and finally, uh, I learn best by reading. Uh, for me, reading the textbook is much more efficient way to learn than watching lectures. I slept through 50 plus percent of uh, lectures uh, in my college graduate school days. Um, lunch lectures, uh, and uh, if you learn well by reading, you'll find that um, you can get through this class mostly by reading the textbook and the canvas pages. But the course has a, a lot of recorded lectures for students who prefer to watch slash listen to lectures. Although, you know, I will say, just being honest, a lot of people say they watch the lectures and I find when I ask them some questions that they don't actually watch them. And then there are people who say, uh, like, the lecture was confusing, like, the, it was confusing once, so I refused to watch the rest of the lectures ever. Okay, I mean, you can read the textbook, <laughs> but I, I do, uh, everything that's in the course, the resources, they are meant to be helpful to you. If they're not helpful, great, you don't have to use it. The only thing I care about is that you learn physics, uh, which I think I can mention um, in a bit. So let me post this so that it'll clear the module requirement. And let me try to get through as much of the, oops, uh, 
as much of the um, uh, module as I can in the next maybe five minutes, leaving a couple minutes left to, to show some of the reorganization I've made and uh, your classmate's name there. So when I post the video on YouTube, I blur those out. That's why I'm careful not to scroll off of this so that I have a fewer seconds of uh, frames to blur when I uh, prepare the recording for YouTube. And I'm gonna go to modules <laughs> so that I can kind of skip around the showing other people's names. I don't wanna blur stuff. So this uh, completing this clear the getting started module. And that has unlocked two modules for me. One is this uh, first lecture module, which I'll go through a little bit. The other is the lab module. So uh, now if you didn't realize that before tomorrow, that's fine. I'll point this out. And what I say in this lesson, lab session for week one, if you didn't see any of it, that's fine. You don't, there's nothing for you to prepare. Uh, you're going to be answering some uh, survey and uh, physics for a, some people did this ahead of time. I guess you can. Uh, for people who haven't done it ahead of time, I will uh, give you time to complete this in lab and you'll have time to discuss it with your classmates um, So we'll do that in the first lab meeting really the first lab meeting the main purpose is that for me to Make sure that you are local you can make it to the lab in person um, and uh, so, so the week after that uh, it's all here so that you will see it as you finish week one and get started on week two We'll have a real lab now for people who are in physics for a probably has uh, seen this because <laughs> it was originally written for 4A. But um, there are some modifications that we can make and there are some improvements you, we can make definitely when it comes to doing the pendulum measurement. I can make available certain tools that you didn't have as part of 4A's version. So so that's the lab portion coming up. I'll remind you of this tomorrow. Um, now, a couple of things that might be... Um, well, for me to point out before trying to go through the rest of the week one module, like as much as I can, is this. Um, you have this module marked optional, and it is totally optional. To, for people, anyone who, um, if it's been a while since you took Physics 4A, these are kind of the homework problems that were in Physics 4A. I picked a few kind of difficult questions that kind of goes through all the topics. And I try to stick to the topics that will be relatively relevant in this class. Uh, so you can go through this anytime as a way to like test yourself, hey, how much stuff do I remember? And uh, I would say, you know, in a question of, set of question, 16 questions, if you can do a quarter of them, so that would be uh, uh, four questions, then, um, then I think we are doing okay. If you can do half of them, then you are in great shape. If you can do 75% of them, you know, 12 questions out of 16, then you are my probably my A student. So, um, but it, it's here, it's, it counts for nothing. It's really there as practice. Uh, if you feel comfortable um, with where you are on mechanics, then you can ignore all this. Um, what is this? Uh, oh yeah, I think this is something else. I would uh, uh, probably have a similar video later. So let me point to that later. Um, so that's one. Two, you will see that in week two, we are starting with uh, electrostatics. <laughs> so it used to be that, um, so when we were in the regular session, we had uh, four weeks for thermodynamics and then 12 weeks of, 12 weeks of <laughs> instruction for electromagnetism. We are in the shortened 14 week session and we used to, we, I guess I still do, have three weeks for thermodynamics and then 11 weeks for electromagnetism. And it used to be that the last week of that electromagnetism fell in the week 14, which is actually same week as the finals for your, all your other classes. That would be this material here. Oops, uh, that would be this material here. Week 11, oh wait, not week 11. Where's week 12? Ah, yeah, week 12, yeah. The Maxwell's equations. This is what I was calling crown jewel of classical physics uh, because uh, the, the you know system of four equations that completely determines, describes a theory of electromagnetism 
And it was coming at a time when people were basically checking out of class, checking out of the semester, you know, well deserved the break and all that. And um, it was never satisfying to me. So what I want to try is swap the order a little bit. I will end up telling you that thermodynamics is all that important. We cover it because we have to. Uh, we have to stick it in some place in the three semester engineering physics sequence. And this is the semester it's stuck in at Peralta. And um, so I think this order reflects that priority better. Covering the so we started uh, with the th uh, thermal physics intro because some of those like calorimetry will use it in some of the homework problems so you need to have seen it and also it might be duplicative of uh, what you might have covered in chemistry if you took general chemistry if you haven't it's fine we'll we're gonna cover it and cover everything from scratch. Um, and then the rest of the material, stuff that you might not have seen in chemistry and stuff that we do care about as a physicist, heat engine cycles, um, it will cover in the last two weeks of the semester. And by the point, if you are, you know, checking out of the semester, then less harm would be done than um, having electromagnetism material, the capstone of the electromagnetism being at the very end. So now you will just have one week on thermal physics intro, which hopefully will be relatively on the easier side. And then we'll switch gears and go right into electrostatics in the second week. Um, and, and I think it will also, the one thing that will help me do is put this uh, electrostatics timed assessment a little bit earlier so that people can hold this meeting earlier. Um, so, so yeah, so let me just go through some of these week one material as test student. I think I can go through some of them super quickly because really all these module requirements are not onerous. Um, I do put additional requirement, this uh, mark has done on the pages that have physics content. So don't do what I'm doing now, which is just clicking it and then moving on. <laughs> don't do that, please. <laughs> do watch the videos, read the textbooks section. Um, these two pages together will probably take about four hours for someone to go through. Um, I mean, it doesn't have to take you four hours, but that's what I'm saying is the normative amount of time for people to take. And then, oh, um, did some of you respond? Yeah, some of you responded already. So let me do the, do the lazy thing here, which is I'm going to say clearing module requirements. And I will later review this properly as an instructor and uh, give it to uh, attention. But as test student here, I'm just going to clear the module requirement so that I can move on. Um, and um, I think, uh, so all the assignments that you've seen so far were Canvas native assignments, um, including the next one you will see. Here's the node on peer review, <laughs> moving on. And here I'm gonna do something that you should not do. I'm just gonna say, uh, yay, module requirement cleared. Uh, don't do this, please. Test student, again, is my worst student. You don't want to be like a test student. He's the, he's the worst. Um, uh, I just want you to get as far as here. Um, well, the next one. So on the problem set and problem set assessment, which is really the core of this class, um, there's a lot of resources to help you with. The next page, homework help page, will be exactly that. And this is the video on how you use those textbook references you will see in the questions, or you can figure out first of all, what's in the questions. And, um, and you know, this video will explain how you can use that to find the right video in the homework helper video. And then problem set, this is the really the heart of the class. Um, this is where most of your time should be spent. You know, your, um, our online lecture, four units, 12 hours weekly, um, that time that you are supposed to spend. Four of those hours, you probably should spend watching the lecture videos, maybe reading textbook. The remaining eight, uh, how do I do this? The remaining eight hours is meant to be spent on problem sets. That's really where it should be. So, um, so as you are starting on the problem set, you're going to have a lot of help in the form of these videos. And uh, in fact, I have worked on this so much in the past few years that I think I've done almost all the homework questions. So what I want to try doing starting this Friday virtual class session is I want to try going through these using generative AI. So I, 
think some of you might be already doing that. But what I want to demonstrate isn't, you know, not doing this. Like if you're doing this, um, sorry, I shouldn't curse, so I won't curse. But if you're doing this, you're not doing yourself any favor. Like if you are just uh, using generative AI to basically cheat, then, you know, uh, is it going to, can I do this? Oh, I uh, can't do that in my head. So let me wait for it to give me my answer. And, uh, oh, minus 40. I probably could have guessed that. Oh, I got two minuses. Um, now, if you are doing this, uh, you are not doing yourself any favor. And that uh, will be apparent when you do the required one-on-one -on -one meeting. But I do think there are ways to use the generative AI in a way that's actually helpful to you. So uh, let me do that in the Friday's uh, virtual class session. Um, I can kind of give ChatGPT a different instruction and uh, model how someone might uh, use something like this to actually as a tutor, not as a cheating tool, because um, it, it uh, really differences in how you use it. Uh, you can use a tool like, like you know, if you if a really smart friend who's good at physics was your friend, you could uh, use their help to cheat. Like, that's old style cheating. Um, or you could uh, use their help to learn physics better. And uh, I think generative AI is basically the same thing, except it's just far more accessible to more people and much cheaper price than hiring tutors. So I think that's uh, all that I have time for. Um, I don't know if I missed anything big in the, oh, the required one-on-one -on -one meeting. Let me uh, dis uh, briefly display it. In, uh, in on screen because most of the pages that have uh, impact on your grade, you have access to right now. Your syllabus already gives the description of the standards for ABC, which will actually be enforced, not some weighted percentage of points. Uh, we do keep scores, mostly as a um, accounting of your efforts and time spent. But other than that, we don't use them to determine A, B, C, and Cs. Uh, these are the actual standards. And some of the structure we have for doing that, uh, I think there's a description of that here. You can read it now. You have access to that. What I will take a minute to show you here is what you will eventually have access to when you get to a uh, timed assessment one, which is between weeks four and five. Required one-on-one -on -one meetings for this class. So that will come after your first set of timed assessment, your first submission of your self-assessment, self-evaluation. You're going to assign yourself a grade uh, or um, you'll write a report that says you give yourself this uh, grade and then justify based on the evidence that you can cite. I hope this gives you some opportunity to think about what you've done and how, um, uh, how well you've learned things in this class. And the main thing that I'm relying on for actually assigning your letter grade, the one that's going to be in your transcript, is through the required one-on-one -on -one meeting. And that one-on-one -on -one meeting is described on this page. So for right now, let me just scroll, slowly scroll through. You can pause the video and read it and bring me any questions. I'm happy to address any questions. Um, for the timing, let me just slowly scroll through it so that it's captured on the shared screen and people can um, uh, read it through it and I'm pausing the video. So uh, I do have some support options that I'm trying to make available and I'll talk about them more, um, I guess, when the time comes. I think we can do a group practice. Um, I think we can do individual practice. Um, I, I was trying to get an embedded tutor for this class and I wasn't able to, but I think even without embedded tutor, there are some things we can do under the heading of practice uh, meeting. So, so this is uh, um, for those of you who might be concerned about grade, this is the main requirement that you should see and be prepared for. Any, any questions you have, ask. I'm happy to answer any questions um, in the in-person lab or here, maybe after I stop the recording. <laughs> so, okay, I think I'm way over, so let me stop it here. I think uh, I haven't uh, missed anything in the uh, what I put on the agenda. Um, so, yeah, so um, if uh, there are any questions from people who are here in real time, thank you for joining in real time. 
and uh, I'll address them. If there aren't any questions, I'm gonna stop the recording uh, and say goodbye to the people joining by recording the video. And then I'll stay online a little bit in case people had questions, but you didn't want to record that screen recording. So I think I've stalled for long enough. If there aren't any questions from people who are here in real time, let me say goodbye to people joining by recording the video. And I'll stay online briefly. So bye to people joining by recording the video. Recording stopped. And let me stop my backup recording.